In the last class, we were discussing about static or synchronous data flow, right? So these are two terms that are sometimes used interchangeably. The primary thing to keep in mind is rather than worrying too much about what exactly is data flow, what is the sort of textbook definition and so on, the more important sort of concept over here is the takeaway, right? I mean, what do we actually mean when we are talking about data flow? And the primary sort of uh, implication of saying that something has a data flow nature is to say that the computations, that is the functions that are being called or the modules that are being operated, essentially have a fixed functionality in the sense that they always operate on the same types of inputs, same number of inputs, do some kind of processing and generate outputs. That does not mean that they always produce the same output uh, you know, uh, in, a, uh, in exactly the same manner. They could sort of look at the data and depending on the data, generate different types of output. Uh, but you know, the, the number of samples consumed and number of samples produced would be fixed. Now, like I said, the general form of SDF, static data flow, is one where the number of tokens that are produced and consumed can be different from one, right? So these numbers that have been sort of marked over here on these edges indicate, so the one, for example, indicates that every time A fires, it produces one token, which now will sit on the edge between A and B. And the two on the incoming edge to B is important. What it says is, in order for B to fire, there have to be at least two tokens on the edge between A and B. Otherwise, B is not yet ready. It does not have sufficient data. Okay. So now, if given this situation, if I ask you this question, let's look at this firing sequence A, B, C. Right. So what happens? The first element over there is A. So let's see what happens after A fires. Right. The graph will now look like this. Structurally, of course, it does not change. The only difference is one token has landed on the A to B edge because A has fired. Okay. Now, according to what I have written, the next thing that should happen is that B should fire. But this cannot happen because at least two tokens must be present on this edge. Why am I saying at least? Because if there were more than two tokens, that's not really a problem, right? It can it, it will of course consume only two and still leave something behind on that channel between A and B. But if there is only one token present, then B simply cannot fire. And effectively, what we are saying is that this is an invalid sequence, right? This is not the same as saying that the system is deadlocked. The system by itself is fine. There is no problem. In fact, uh, as you can imagine, the simplest way of getting around this is that A fires one more time, right? And if A fires one more time, it will produce two tokens. There, there will be two tokens on the A to B channel and B can then fire because it has sufficient tokens on the input. All that I'm saying is this particular sequence A, B, C is invalid. All right. Now, what about this sequence, right? This is a much longer and sort of complicated looking sequence, but let's go through the same process, right? What I'm going to do is just to keep things simple. I'll draw a slightly simplified version of the diagram over here, right? And what I'm saying is after step one, right? after the first A, what I'm going to end up with is one token on this edge. After the second A, I will end up with two tokens on the edge. Third A, three tokens. Fourth A, four tokens. Right? Whereas the B to C edge remains unchanged. Now what happens with the first firing of B? It consumes two tokens from the A to B edge, which means that I will be left with two tokens on the A to B edge. And when B fires, it produces three tokens on the B to C edge, right? So what I'll end up with over here is three tokens. Now, C fires one time. This does not affect the A to B edge. It remains as it is. It does, however, consume one token from the B to C edge. So that reduces to two. C fires one more time, and the result is going to be this, okay? now. According to the sequence, B is supposed to fire again. And what happens when B fires this time around? 
it is going to consume the remaining two tokens from the A to B H and produce three more tokens onto the B C H. Right? Notice that by looking at this diagram, you can't really make out which was the first token or second token or anything of that sort. Right? I mean, the point is that these are FIFO channels, first in, first out channels. So, of course, the token that was produced first will be the token that is consumed first by C. But I really don't care. I mean, all that I care is the number of tokens so that I know how many times a particular uh, node can fire. Now, this basically tells us that from this point, I can now have four consecutive firings of C, each of which will reduce in this number, reducing until finally we are left with no tokens on the A to B edge, no tokens on the B to C edge. And we have come back to the original state of the system. Okay. So this was basically to sort of give you an example of how we can work through a firing sequence. The previous sequence ABC was invalid because I end up in a situation where I don't have enough tokens. This second or rather the third sequence that I've drawn over here, which is like this long sequence is fine. All that it does is it basically results in some accumulation of tokens followed by removal of the tokens. Okay. Now, as we move forward, I will also give you some more examples of what exactly these functions and tokens are like, right? I mean, bring it in the context of software because it's actually easier to understand in the context of software rather than hardware. We'll get to those examples soon. Now, there is one more thing that we can look at over here, right? In terms of, I mean, after all, the channel between A and B is basically a FIFO channel, right? It's a first in, first out, some kind of a buffer. Now, what does it mean if I say that I draw the symbol D to indicate that there is one token already present on the edge A to B, right? So effectively what I'm saying in that case is there is an edge from A to B and there is an edge from B to C, right? I'm saying that right up front, there is one token present here and then similarly, there is two D. So that means there are two tokens present on the B to C edge, okay? Now, with this in mind, if I now go ahead and take some kind of a firing pattern, let's say that I take A fires, all that I'm saying is, as a result of this, there will be two tokens sitting on A to B. Okay, So that initial token, these were essentially some kind of initial values, something to get the algorithm started so that we don't sort of starve for data initially. Okay. And with that in mind, if we now think of firing sequences, right, we can basically go through this, this A, B followed by whatever so many C's, right? Let's once again go through the same diagram over here, the A, B, C edges, the initial state has one token here and two tokens on B, C. Then I have A firing, it results in two tokens here and the same all two tokens on the BC edge. Now, B fires once, it takes away the tokens from AB, but puts three more tokens onto the BC edge for a total of five. Now, I have one, two, three, four, five. The AB edge remains unchanged. This reduces. until finally I have nothing, no tokens left, right? Which means that the final state that I have over here looks like this, A, B, C, right? And the numbers over there just basically indicate the number of tokens produced and consumed. The primary difference being, this is, these are gone, right? The initial tokens are no longer present over here. So the final state after this firing sequence is different from what I started with. On the other hand, if I take another sequence, A, A, B, C, 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 right? Now, let me do the same thing over here. I end up with A to B to C. Initial value is one over here, two over here. I have A, A, which gives me two and then three, right? And then I have one B, which takes away two of those values. And sorry, uh, of course, over here, this remains unchanged. Yeah. Adds three more values on the BCH. Now I have C. 
C and one more C, which brings me back basically to my initial state. Okay, so the point is this sequence, if you look at it, right, two times A, one time B, three times C, will has brought me back to whatever initial state I started from. And if you think about it, you will realize that this is actually not so much a fluke. It is actually a property of these relative numbers, this one, two, three, all of these things. Given these numbers that I have on the edges over here, I can actually compute possible sequences, which will bring me back to my original state. Okay. So there is effectively, in other words, I can define this as one complete iteration of the system. Right. Now, you might be wondering, I mean, what is happening over here? A is fired twice, right? So it looks as though some processing is happening with two samples, B is happening only once, C is happening three times. Typically, this is used, in other words, this kind of modeling is used primarily for modeling so-called multi-rate signal processing systems. Right? Decimators, interpolators, and arbitrary rate converters, right? In fact, one of the changes that is typically brought, uh, one of the systems that is typically used when describing something like this is the fact that when you have audio processing, right, you have like format conversion. So CD, compact discs, which are almost non-existent these days, right? So hopefully all of you have at least seen a CD at some point. CD audio, right, was recorded at the rate of 44 kilohertz. Right? And there was something else called digital audio tape, DAT, which was a very high quality another alternative which was being proposed around the time that CDs became popular which was at 48 kilohertz similarly you could also have something else at 16 kilohertz there is like lower quality CD at 20 a CD at 22 kilohertz lots of different rates are there and the rate conversions between these are all some kind of you know interpolation decimation filtering kind of operations this kind of multi-rate data flow graphs were a good way of representing the kind of rate conversions that happen in such a situation and you know this kind of analysis saying what is it that is one complete iteration allows you to sort of chalk out chunks of the input data which after processing i mean which can be processed and will basically you know bring your system back to its original state and allow you to process the entire data in chunks 